Grace to you and peace from God the Father and from his Son, your Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Rejoice! That's what Gaudete means. Today, we rejoice. And as the, uh, the collect of the day said, we pray and implore that our Lord Jesus Christ would lighten the darkness of our hearts. Now in centuries, the centuries that have been since Christ was raised from the dead, the church has adopted various liturgical customs. And one of those are the colors of the pyramids and the vestments that the clergy wear. For a time in Salisbury, England, where they had the Sarum Rite, as it came to be called, and in the Scandinavian countries, there was a tradition of having black pyramids for Lent and for Advent. But liturgically speaking, black is not black. Black can mean more than black, meaning black can mean purple, or black can mean dark blue. I don't know how they came up with that, but that's what it was. And so, in these northern areas, they ended up having purple or violet for, for Lent. And some would argue that they, would, that they had blue also for Advent. Now that blue, as some would argue, could be that just the pyramids were old and that the bright purple pigment had faded to blue. But no matter what, people thought it was blue. And there will be clergymen today and those who advocate for more of a Roman calendar of colors that we should have violet or purple for Advent. To which I say, so what? There is a tradition in our churches of having blue. So that's why we have blue for Advent. Or at least, that's how I argue it. Some would say that a, a liturgical church house from, from Massachusetts were the ones who originated it in the 20th century. And there may be a slight bit of truth to that. It could also be that, that people were just renewing an older tradition, which is the one that I like. But the lightning of that candle there, you see it in, it's pink, right? Well, men who are not comfortable with wearing pink or using that color will say that the, it's a rose-colored candle. Because as I was talking about during Advent and Lent, you could have purple or violet for the liturgical color of the season. So if you're going to lighten the darkness of your hearts, well then maybe we should lighten the color of the pyramids and vestments. And so a lighter shade of violet is rose. Now there are Lutheran pastors that will say, I wouldn't be caught dead wearing a pink, pink stole or a pink chest. Now I have no problem with it because I and comfortable in my masculinity. Okay, that was a joke, by the way. I have, I don't care. It's a nice color to wear, it changes things up a little bit. Plus it kind of goes along with the collect for the day. Now, because we have switched to blue, some might even make the argument, well maybe we should go with a lighter blue candle. No, that would be going a step too far. Or not, I don't know. But we keep the rose candle. Because we want to lighten our mood a little bit. And we want to rejoice. And from a purely liturgical perspective, this fast and the season of preparation for the feast is almost over. And so like in Lent, we have what's called Laetare Sunday in Lent. And guess what that word also means? Rejoice! Another word for it. 
So today we rejoice and we pray and implore God would lighten the darkness of our hearts. And yet strangely enough, our gospel lesson involves something and someone who probably didn't have all that much to rejoice about. Right? We have John the Baptist. And by Baptist, I don't mean that he was of a denomination from America or from a denomination that denies infant baptism or denies that baptism saves, but rather John the Baptist, meaning he is the one who was the baptizer. He was the one who prepared the way for the Lord through the baptism that he preached and performed. But he doesn't, you think, that he doesn't have much to rejoice over. After all, he's in prison. Now he was not imprisoned for preaching against Herod. He was not imprisoned for preaching against the sin that was going on in that household and the incestuous relationship, as well as probably all of the other debauchery that was going on in that house. He was preaching against it. But the reason why he was imprisoned and the reason why Herod persecuted him is because Herod was a tyrant. And what, John, what was John doing? He was out there preaching, calling people to repentance and preparing them for a savior. Preparing them for another kingdom. And if you are a petty tyrant, you are jealous for your power. And you cannot have your people that you have subjugated and who have been placed over by, over you. You have been placed over them. You can't let them have any hope. John was imprisoned because he gave the people hope. Now he lost his head because Herod is a fool. Herod really didn't want to cut off his head. But he was trapped by the word of a promise that he made in one of those lewd moments that was happening in his own household. So while John is languishing, languishing in prison, some pastors would say, well, maybe John doubted. That's why he wants to hear this, this phrase and the, get the answer to this question. Are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? Now, there are a lot of pastors who will make a lot of hay off of that whole line of thinking today. But Jesus answers the question right off the bat. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind, which is a euphemism for a preacher or a leader who waffles and flips and flops from doctrine to doctrine and can't stand firm. So Jesus answers that question rather quickly. So the question of did John doubt really should not take up all that much time. And in the church's infinite wisdom, and I believe by God's providence, we have another saint who where we will deal with the question of doubt before we celebrate Christmas. And that will be Thomas this coming Wednesday, because the church celebrates his day on, I believe, the 21st. That's Thursday. And so we will mark that day this Wednesday. And so we will deal with the question of doubt, and we will leave the doubting to Thomas and not to John. Because John knew, John knew from the womb, right? He leapt for joy. He was given the revelation from the Holy Spirit who descended and rested upon Jesus when he baptized him. Though reluctantly, he needed encouragement from Jesus. Let us now do this to fulfill all righteousness. 
And John submitted. John baptized Jesus. The Holy Spirit descends from heaven, rests on Jesus in the water. And the voice was born from heaven. This is my beloved son. There, there is no room for doubt with John. He knew. He knew that this was the one that he was preparing the way for, and the Holy Spirit pointed it out to him. And the very next day, he sees Jesus walking by, and he doesn't miss a beat. What does he say? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Andrew and another disciple, they didn't hesitate. They went right away. They went and started to inquire of Jesus, where are you staying? The thing about Jesus is Jesus is different than John. And there are those who would be offended by Jesus' ministry. And there's probably some of John's disciples who do have some doubts about Jesus who have their own reservations, who may be offended by Jesus' ministry. Because John fits the bill, doesn't he? He's out in the wilderness. He's a little eccentric. His life is rather austere. He wears the funny outfit with the camel's hair. And he eats the funny diet, the locusts and the wild honey. What does Jesus do? Jesus is not out in the wilderness. He's not leading an austere life. He's out in the midst of the people. And he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners. What? So John, as he is in jail, still has disciples hanging on to John and probably thinking, Oh, come on, John. You're really the Messiah, aren't you? So John, he's in jail. And what is he? He hears the deeds of the Christ. And he still has these few disciples hanging on for dear life to him. He heard the deeds of the Christ. He knows. He does not desire to have his doubt assuaged, but rather I think he wants to hear the gospel. He wants to hear the gospel from Jesus' mouth. And also he wants to, once again, send these disciples to Jesus. Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? That we does not include John. That we is for the disciples who are going to see Jesus. So what does Jesus say? Go and tell John what you hear and see. Blind receive their sight. Lame walk. Lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear and the dead are raised up. And the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed are those who are not offended. By me. So they go back to John, undoubtedly, and they tell them what Jesus said. So what do you think John said when they got back? Why did you come back? You heard it from him. And they've likely heard it from John, who's told them probably every day, I'm not the Christ. He is. Go follow him. Then Jesus, what does he do? He praises John. He praises John for who he is. So that people might know John is not the Messiah. And more importantly, that John's place is very important. And what Jesus says about him, John would not even claim. Now, Jesus is right doesn't mean that John is wrong. It just means that John is very humble. 
John claims to merely be just a voice. But Jesus says of him that he is the messenger, the very fulfiller of scripture. Behold, I send my messenger before your, for, before your face, who will prepare your way before you. And this is what John did. And what did he prepare? Yes, he was out in the wilderness, not a place where you can build highways, really. And yet that is precisely what he was doing. He went out into the wilderness and people who were crooked, people who were not very level, who had hills and valleys, who were filled with sin, were going out to Jesus so that the highway could be prepared. The highway was a path not for them to trod on, but rather the pathway for the Messiah to come into their hearts. John's preaching was one where he preached the whole counsel of God. He preached that people were sinners. He said as much that the scribes and Pharisees, he called them who were so full of themselves and filled with pride, a brood of vipers. He didn't mince words. He got right to the point. He called sinners to repentance, warned them of the wrath to come, called them to repentance, baptized those who repented, preparing them for the Christ and calling them to live lives of faith, live lives of expectation and hope, awaiting the Messiah who was very quickly going to show himself to the world. And he did. Christ's ministry was revealed very soon after John's began. Even while he was in prison, he continued to point people to Jesus. John was more than a prophet. He was more than he was not some kind of waffler. He wasn't somebody that wore soft clothing. And if there was ever anyone who fit the bill from a human perspective of what, of what we might expect the Messiah to be, it would be John. But he was not the Messiah. He was merely the one who prepared the way. Now today, in the church, we continue to hear John's voice. We continue to hear the voice of one crying in the wilderness. But what is this world? The wilderness of sin, wild animals, beasts running all about, unchained and untamed. The church cries out, and her ministers from the towers of Zion, crying out into the wilderness for people to repent, for people to come to Jesus, to be prepared for his coming, to be ready for when he comes again in great glory. Be prepared now before it's too late. Be ready. And not merely that, be ready for him who has already been here. The Christ who came, who suffered, who came here to be the one who is the least in the kingdom. And Jesus speaks of this, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. That is not a call for people to try to be better than John. But it is a statement about the one that John was preparing the way for. The Messiah, the Christ, who came to be servant of all, who served the blind, the deaf, the mute, the lame, and even those who could no longer hear and were dead. But even more so, he came to serve all of humanity in 
in spite of its sin, in spite of our sin, that even yet while we were sinners, Christ died for us. And he came in loving service to do this so that we might have life. Jesus Christ is the one who is least in the kingdom. He is the one who came to serve, and he is the one who continues to serve. And that is a comforting thing. That is the good news, that the Christ who comes will tend his sheep, that he will take care of his lambs and he will love them. And the shepherd, the good shepherd, will lay down his life for the sheep, and he did so, so that they might have life so that you might have life, and you do have life in him. Christ came to serve, and he has served you. This is what the church continues to preach and must continue to preach. The very content of the preaching of John, the very content of the preaching of Jesus, the very content of the prophets and the apostles, so that people can be prepared for everlasting life, so that people can be prepared for the judgment, so that people can be prepared to meet God and be worthy to stand, about his, stand around his throne forever. And it is Christ who has made all of this possible. And John was given the service to prepare the way for Jesus. And so the ministers of God, not as originators of any of this, but rather just as stewards, continue on the work of those who have gone before us to prepare God's people to meet their Savior. We have much to rejoice in, members of Hope. We have much to rejoice in today. We have much for which our hearts should be glad and our hearts should be lightened. Because yes, Christmas is almost here. The celebration is at hand, it is close. But as I heard this week from one pastor, one of the possibilities of Advent is the hope that this year Christmas might not come because Jesus may come again before the celebration takes place. And oh, what a celebration it will be if that does happen. For it will be far greater than any Christmas, far greater than any Easter. For the God who was incarnate, the God who was raised, the God who was sent, is going to come. He's going to take us home. And we will celebrate in that unending feast of joy where were the songs of rejoicing and the songs of hope be the songs of reality in that moment, the songs of love, because Christ has come. So let us rejoice this day, and let us continue to be prepared and to be filled with anticipation, not only for Christmas, but for when our Lord returns. Amen.